уважаемые коллеги, я думаю, что мы будем звать. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start the session. Uh, there is still quite a big line downstairs. Uh, so people will continue to come in. Uh, that should not bother us. I am sure uh, this will uh, not be in the way of our interesting panel discussion. You see the list of participants. I am not going to introduce everyone. I will just introduce the panelists when I give them the floor. In this room, uh, we have people who are interested in corporate law. I guess if you are, then um, obviously you have something to do with it. And you know the people who are in this room. Four and a half years ago, uh, the fourth chapter of the Civil Code has seen some changes. This later uh, was recognized as a corporate law reform. When that happened, we thought that uh, a large number of uh, issues and questions that we have been accumulating since 1989, uh, that is the time when uh, country level uh, documents uh, and laws have been drafted. Then in 1990, a new law on entrepreneurship has been passed. And that was the uh, beginning or the resurrection uh, of the corporate law. Uh, the miracle has not happened. We did not get answers to the questions uh, we were hoping uh, to address. Today, we are at a very interesting point in time. We see the beginning of the next phase of changes in many regulations related to life and operation of corporations. Things have become much more difficult uh, with the arrival of blockchain technologies. Uh, now we have things like token uh, programs uh, and campaigns, and that added the complexity. Here at Gaidar Forum, the organizers are going to uh, publish presentation materials. Uh, the organization uh, that uh, came up with an initiative to hold uh, this uh, session is also going to post all the presentations. We will see uh, what is the best way to disseminate uh, the materials. The easiest way would uh, definitely be to just send electronic files, but we'll make sure that everybody has access to our working materials. We'll make sure that you do not leave here empty-handed. We hope that uh, you will have uh, some interesting food for thought, and uh, our work at this session makes a good contribution to development of corporate law. Uh, some of you may know that uh, there have been two groups, interagency group under the government, and uh, there is one expert council under the Ministry of Economic Development. Both groups address the same scope of issues, that is the development of uh, corporate governance and the development uh, of uh, corporate law and associated strategy. People who work in those expert groups and councils are also present here. So today, uh, people in the audience will have a chance to hear from the horse's mouth, get the latest news on the development of uh, corporate law. We will learn what is new 
compared to 2014. We'll see whether we have made any progress or whether we are going back, whether things have become clearer or more confusing. Uh, this is how we're going to proceed uh, with this session. Uh, this is the third day of the Gaidar Forum, and we have limited time. Today, we are bringing the forum to the end, and uh, we know that usually the most exciting, most interesting things happen at the end. We have to uh, finish this panel within one hour and 45 minutes. We have received an extra 15 minutes time. This is not a lot. There are very many issues that we want to talk about. So please uh, understand me if I ask you to stop if you go beyond the time limit that uh, you have been given. Panelists will receive uh, 10 minutes each, and uh, then we will also be giving people up to five minutes for comments and uh, discussions. I started by saying that uh, we are now developing this strategy for uh, development of corporate law. Uh, therefore, I would like uh, to pass the floor to Irina Shitkina, uh, who uh, is uh, working for a number of organizations. Uh, uh, she works for Moscow State University. She is also uh, a, a practicing uh, lawyer. She is a managing partner at Shitkina and Partners. And she's also an independent uh, director at Transcontainer and uh, chairman of the board at Elinar Holding Company. I have limited time, and I will skip the introduction of my presentation, uh, which contains a general overview of the situation. It has already been provided by Mr. Mogilevsky. Let me talk briefly about uh, the uh, current state of reforms. I think this is a reform of the corporate law. It was launched in 2014. Today, uh, federal legislation is out of sync uh, with the civil code, and it is difficult uh, to uh, figure out uh, the relations uh, between various laws that regulate uh, the work of corporations. Uh, corporate uh, relations are covered by uh, civil law. However, uh, there are many differences. Uh, we do not have a proper uh, scientific foundation in this uh, section of the law. There are still uh, some debates about the classification of legal entities, but that is not what I want to talk about. There are many challenges that we're facing. Uh, corporate law is uh, looking for a balance of interests uh, between different stakeholders. It's looking for its uh, place uh, in the uh, scope of laws in Russian Federation. We are witnessing a number of things. Uh, the uh, development of corporate law is uh, taken care of uh, by the executive branch of power. There's a number of expert councils that deal with corporate governance. There are several working groups and councils. They look not only at matters of corporate governance, they look at transactions, contracts, uh, things uh, which do not uh, pertain uh, to uh, corporate governance uh, per se. There is a road map uh, for improvement of corporate governance. Uh, it's a document that goes back to 2016. The previous document uh, is dated 2013. There is a uh, 
plan of uh, actions uh, that uh, have to take place for improvement uh, of the corporate governance uh, situation. Uh, pretty much is done uh, in line with this roadmap, uh, despite uh, some difficulties and delays. And this is a big landmark. We have a plan. It's not a strategy, but it's a plan. The purpose of this plan is uh, to uh, protect minority shareholders and uh, to improve the quality of corporate governance. Uh, the uh, initial roadmap of 2013 had a different objective that was uh, to improve Russia's uh, position in doing business rating. However, uh, as the environment changes, we change our objectives. Uh, this roadmap covers the period through 2019. We see new challenges, uh, new issues in our life. And uh, today we uh, have created several working groups, as Mr. Mogilevsky said. Uh, there are uh, several groups. One of them is interagency group organized by the Russian Federation government. Uh, there has been uh, a very interesting presentation uh, at uh, this forum made by the chairman of that group. They work in uh, several directions. One uh, mission is uh, to unify governance uh, in uh, public uh, companies. I am just uh, giving you the big picture. Uh, that is uh, the objective that they have stated. Uh, they want uh, to make sure that uh, the uh, rules are the same for various companies. Uh, Gazprom or Airflot, they should have the same uh, types of uh, statute documents. Uh, that is a major unification effort. Uh, this is something uh, that we have to uh, think about properly. Many companies have already implemented best international practices. Uh, they have uh, codes of corporate governance, and uh, they have to uh, at least stay at this level, or better yet, uh, do even better. For non-public uh, companies, uh, there are other sets of tasks. Uh, that have been identified by the working group. And that is the second uh, line of their work. Yet another area, uh, that is uh, companies uh, that are uh, owned by the government. In the first session of a working group, uh, they uh, voiced uh, their uh, highly democratic vision. Uh, they said uh, that uh, Members of the board uh, shall vote uh, for uh, certain uh, directives, and they assume all risks associated uh, with uh, that document. And that is not a good uh, practice uh, for government-owned corporations. And uh, those uh, other practices uh, should improve the quality of governance. Yet another area uh, in which uh, they developed new documentation. In June uh, 2018, the government raised an issue of elimination of redundant uh, requirements uh, for charters of corporations. Uh, they, the government issued a resolution uh, that required uh, that uh, a new strategy uh, for uh, corporate uh, charters should be developed. Uh, that was also uh, to cover uh, joint stock companies. These are the four main domains uh, that this interagency working group uh, covers. Uh, they focused on strategy. Uh, so far, there has been no strategic objective uh, set uh, by uh, the working group that uh, I have been referring to or uh, an expert council associated with the Ministry of Economic Development. 
Uh, my uh, colleague, Mr. Mogilevsky, is familiar with this document. Uh, it's a confidential document. It, and it is a confidential document because it is not ready to be made public. It does not have a an anti -an logic. Uh, they have uh, collected inputs from different members of the community, and uh, they uh, did not uh, really uh, digest it. And uh, they did not turn it into one uh, comprehensive document. <laughs> Uh, yes, so when we discussed it, uh, there was a talk about publishing it openly so that we could all comment. We were against it because it was impossible to publish it this way, of course. All right, because it needs further punishment, it needs uh, further discussion, and we should mention that this is not the opinion of the government. In terms of causes and consequences and other topics, it needed to be finalized. It, and we agreed that we were not going to focus on developing a strategy. We decided to find the most important priorities and start working on it. And this is the approach we suggested to the Minister of Economic Development. I very much hope that I will be able to prove to them my points of view that we really need a strategy. We cannot make scattered changes because in any case, we need to see the final goal for which we work and seeing a goal having a goal we will be able to find the tools to achieve it and you know that the, there were different goals lobbied by different groups and i'm not saying anything bad about lobbying for instance the national council for corporate uh, uh, management of russian union of industrialists and entrepreneurs uh, uh, and I like them, by the way. They have uh, very good experts and they have a very united uh, approach to corporate law. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that they could g uh, make a very good uh, contribution to the process. And I'm not against them lobbying their interests and their approach. But at least the concept should be a unified one. It should have a logic in it, and I very much hope that uh, working along these four key priorities, the working group will come to a conclusion that a strategy of development of corporate law is a must-have. This is my answer to your question whether there is a strategy or not. No, it's yet in our minds, uh, and we don't even have any action plan yet. And last thing I wanted to tell you, considering I don't have much time left for my presentation, it's about uh, eliminating excessive uh, requirements. Uh, uh, in August uh, 2018, uh, there was a discussion on how we could eliminate uh, excessive requirements to the uh, articles. Uh, and uh, we then agreed that it makes no sense to repeat the same as the law says. They said the law should include as many particular rules as possible and uh, write in the law, for instance, something like the uh, Provision size should be 5% uh, unless otherwise stipulated in the articles and so on. And they s said that then the articles of uh, incorporation could become much shorter than. And uh, for instance, if nothing else is said about this, then uh, automatically uh, it would mean, uh, if we write this in the law, that uh, it's 5% uh, for the board, 5% uh, uh, for the rest. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, draft was criticized, but the question is so important, I think. It's a pity we don't have enough time to discuss it now, but I still think you have to think about the nature of articles of cooperation. Is that an internal document or is it uh, 
a law-like doc document. It's a transaction-related document, okay, but today we have more radical or less radical approaches to this document. Uh, uh, and those who are talking about the articles of incorporation as a deal, as a transaction, they say that if the law changes, the articles of incorporation continues being in force unless uh, any major changes have taken place. This is a very widespread uh, attitude. While I support uh, Mrs. Makovska's attitude and uh, saying that if we are talking about corporal, uh, corporate law, uh, the uh, law should prevail over the uh, articles of incorporation of a corporate entity. This is a very interesting question for further discussion. Maybe our colleagues will continue discussing it when we have time for questions and answers. But I wanted to say a few more things. Listen, if you write everything into the articles, it's not that harmless. We know. We know when some changes take place in the law, and then based on all the rules, uh, the uh, uh, rules of the articles of incorporation prevail uh, and then you will see that only those uh, who have written the articles uh, have the right to do this or that and uh, the old rules apply and if uh, the company did not change the articles uh, and just took the older version not long ago, it was uh, ruled that if the articles of incorporation uh, has a different uh, algorithm of uh, of uh, making transactions uh, asso uh, associated transactions. Uh, uh, then uh, these rules should uh, prevail. But again, this is not harmless these changes. If you write something extra, you think that if you write into your articles the current law, uh, some ex abstracts from the current law, it may happen that the law itself will change. But if you took this abstract from the old law, which doesn't uh, work anymore, but it, uh, this abstract is in your articles, your articles prevail, and you will have to live with this old law because you wrote this down into your article, so beware. I never heard from someone that they left Russian jurisdiction because our articles are very long and vague. No, they quit Russia because our mechanisms are not flexible, that, uh, because of bureaucracy or whatever, but no one said that they quit business in Russia because of our articles. And what about those who say, let's make articles not longer than three pages, for instance, uh, or let's give a subsidy to those who make a shorter articles uh, or whatever. But this is the habit of Russian entrepreneurs, they like writing long articles. They like taking abstracts from the laws and incorporating them into the articles. And as a result, for the entrepreneur to like the articles, the articles should be written in a very extravagant way. I know everyone uh, hates uh, standardized uh, articles because there are some 36 templates and you have to read all of them and have some understanding to choose the right one. But there are eight blocks and uh, they are currently wait, uh, working on uh, technologies on how to structure the articles, multiple directors, uh, the right to exit and whatever. They uh, did argued with Maxim Areshkin at that session, but 
these articles, you can uh, make articles based on a template, based on standard blocks. And of course, what many people say now, the article should be electronic. Yes, it can be signed uh, with an uh, e-signature and it should be posted somewhere electronically, right? And uh, talking about compatibility of information uh, in the single registry of uh, corporate entities uh, and uh, in the articles, for instance. You don't need this information to be in both places. So you have to think about the uh, compatibility between the articles uh, and the uh, uh, documents of the corporate entity. And only when we make this more convenient, the entrepreneurs will agree to make articles sh shorter. I know I already took too much time, so I'm ready to answer your questions, if any. Thank you. While we are waiting about the questions, uh, Irina spoke about 36 standard or template articles, and this is only for limited liability companies. For other forms of incorporation, there are no standard articles suggested. And currently, the Institute of Public Law and uh, other related institutes have now received a task to develop a standard uh, template of articles uh, for an open joint stock company, for instance. Uh, I wanted to add one more thing to what you just said. In the framework of these uh, areas, uh, uh, there was such a thing as accept, accepting uh, agreements uh, as uh, inapplicable. Uh, just imagine what should change in our business community to publish this idea. Because making amendments to the civil code. I'm not even saying anything about the uh, civil code because uh, we can look at the explanations given by the 25th plenary meeting of the Supreme Court. And since Denis Novak, uh, Deputy Minister of Justice of Russian Federation, is uh, related to this kind of work, I would like to ask him about uh, bona fide in corporate law. Because there was a controversial attitude to concluded deals, uh, deals concluded by the person which, uh, who is not the general manager, for instance, of the corporate entity, and so on. Thank you. Talking about the role of the reform which was uh, held in uh, uh, 2012, uh, you know, in the uh, corporate entities section of the document, there is a special focus on bona fide attitude in uh, corporate law. There was something about it in Article 4, in Chapter 4, Article 53, uh, where there's just one sentence that you have to uh, work uh, based on this bona fide principle. And uh, in Article 53.1, about uh, we see information about liability of a corporate entity. And uh, there is something new for the civil code, uh, from the civil code. And we should probably mention three, three new changes in Article 62 which says that uh, you should not do anything or omit doing anything uh, being uh, against the uh, goals of the corporation. Uh, you should uh, 
participate in making decisions uh, if it is necessary to make a decision. Colleagues, look at something. If we unite all these uh, four uh, duties, uh, we will have something which is very similar to what we write in the contracts. Uh, uh, commitment or obligation to act with bona fide uh, to, to the best interests of, of the uh, corporate entity and so on. So finally, we have an understanding that the duties of the director and the participants, they have the same uh, connotation, I'm talking about fiduciary uh, duties. For the director, I mean the person who is managing the corporate entity on a daily basis, this director should not only act uh, with the knowledge and everything, but also reasonably having common sense. And we have to ask him to be responsible in making decisions. And the director, his main duty is not just not to steal, but his uh, duty and uh, commitment is to make money for the uh, corporation. If we are talking about participants, they are usually non-professionals. And that's why they usually hire managers who would act uh, in the uh, reasonable framework, but as soon as the participant starts meddling into the uh, management, uh, giving instructions on what the uh, board of directors should do and so on, then based on the civil code, we read uh, that the person uh, who is acting as a corporate entity uh, will have full liability. And when we saw this in the law, we finished this, this discussion because uh, we had a discussion, a serious discussion about whether the participants uh, or the members of the society have the obligation not to harm their society because we discussed a similar situation. Can we, for instance, hire a director if uh, he took advantage uh, of certain knowledge? And uh, everyone said that as a member, he did not really violate any rules. This is what the others argued. So half of the uh, jury were for, half were against. Plus, this position now prevails. This approach now prevails. There is no difference between the director and the uh, members in terms of responsibility. Because now the director, even being a shareholder, he has no right to prioritize his interest as over the interests uh, of the society. This is about joint decision making, and that's also important uh, in terms of understanding when or when the shareholder could be uh, it, uh, held liable. What do you think the uh, member can be uh, sued for, for knowing about something? No, if the member or the participant does not participate in managing, if he does not give any formal orders uh, or when consulting his director and uh, board of directors, then low standards should apply because 
the uh, main focus in this case is for the person to act in a loyal way. And the question about how reasonable are his actions, that's a separate question. And of course, first of all, the person should be liable in case of uh, uh, making a decision or doing something detrimental to the company, knowing that it would be harmful to the company. But if the person did not know that by his actions or decisions he could harm the company's business, then this is different. And this rule, it uh, actually applies to the person who does such actions uh, and who decides on them. And uh, there are some questions now. Okay, if you have any questions, I can ask them. About bona fide, I actually said what I thought. I said what I wanted. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Let's continue. And since we are talking about the conflict of interests, uh, we have this in the laws. Still in different laws, we see different definitions of this notion. How is this going to evolve in the framework of corporate law? Because a lot of what I hear, it's about harming the company's business. Uh, this is about uh, criminal penalties, but what about the conflict of interest? Of course, directly no one's going to harm the company's business, right? Because this is traceable. But everyone understands that uh, uh, the, uh, sometimes uh, one of the owners of the company can act in the interest of a, com a, a competitor company. Now, I don't see a need to change anything in the existing laws because it's all in the civil code i said that the members of the corporate entity and others based on article 174 paragraph one it's all stipulated there and by, by, by the way, there is no ban on setting up joint ventures uh, by two competing companies, for instance. If you just want to uh, do your business in another territory, for instance. And we understand that if the partners are going to be reasonable and co uh, and if this joint venture is organized and works in uh, the territory of a third region, it will be wrong and it will be violation of commitments of one of participants, one of the parties to the agreement. If one of the parties to the agreement comes to that third region and starts trying to manipulate and uh, manage the entity on its own. Uh, but I think that this situation is uh, uh, very rightfully regulated in the description of uh, deals with an interest uh, and um, there should be a proof given on whether this transaction can be considered uh, as uh, Ill invalid uh, due to the fact that there was a knowledgeable action. What sanctions uh, do you think should apply to those who, uh, whose actions uh, resulted in uh, a uh, harm to in harm to the company? You should be acting in the best interests of your companies. If you did not, then one of the members, one of participants can uh, charge uh, another one. Uh, and uh, Alexandra Makovska, for instance, uh, she was talking about a possibility of claiming uh, losses to be paid. Uh, uh, I mean the claim coming from one shareholder to another one. If the action of one shareholder resulted in harm 
uh, to the other one. And then uh, now we have this law which makes it possible to claim such uh, uh, such uh, losses uh, uh, plus uh, behavior, improper behavior, which is harmful for the companies or someone else's business. And you have to understand that these uh, generalistic uh, obligations, uh, they may be uh, special or generic rules of loss coverage applied. Thank you. And I just had an idea. Our topic is the trends of development of corporate law. At the same time, talking about the strategy of development, uh, uh, what we want to have, what we want to generate, we always speak about uh, economic uh, unities or corporate entities. Uh, corporations in line with the uh, changed uh, chapter four include a much larger number of legal entities and uh, that uh, creates uh, quite a range of problems. Um, I would like to share one doubt uh, that I have uh, about uh, the very need uh, to uh, retain this one form of incorporation. Uh, a non-public joint stock company uh, turns into a limited liability company that can issue shares. Why so? Because uh, we have uh, contributions uh, in property. We are now looking at many different things. Uh, well there's been some proposals of different sorts. Uh, so far it has not happened yet, uh, but they have made an agreement on a preferred stock. Uh, that is uh, that uh, uh, they may be used as voting shares. And this brings about a question. Uh, do the legislators think at all about uh, the uh, criteria for division between different types of uh, corporations, how they are incorporated, uh, how they are unique in their different forms? Do we really need so many different categories? I would invite uh, Professor Lomakin uh, of uh, the Moscow State uh, University and uh, member of a uh, advisory board uh, under the Supreme Court of Russian Federation uh, to make comments on this. Uh, the trends which we see in development of uh, corporate law, uh, the concept of uh, uh, bona fides, uh, all those things uh, should be looked at together. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mogilevsky. Uh, when you put a question whether the legislators think about the classification of uh, legal entities, I think the answer is yes. However, they are not very consistent uh, in implementing uh, the decisions uh, which they are making. Uh, there is a division between corporations and uh, unitary legal entities. Uh, corporations uh, usually uh, have uh, several specific uh, features. Uh, there is uh, shareholding and uh, there is uh, a managing board now let us see uh, whether the uh, legislature really uh, uses uh, those uh, criteria. I am not referring uh, to the language, to the terminology. Uh, definitely we have uh, a lot of inconsistency. Uh, there's this term, uh, government corporation, which uh, really is not a corporation, but it uh, goes beyond that. 
uh, we uh, don't even have a clear definition of a corporation. Well, look at uh, public movements. Uh, if you look up a, a civil code, you will see that this is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, this is uh, some kind uh, of an entity, public entity. There is a federal law uh, of 1995 uh, that uh, contains the definition uh, for such organizations. If you look it up, you will see that a public movement is an organization that consists of members, that consists of participants, but they are not members. So there is no membership uh, which uh, is a feature of a corporation. Uh, there is another uh, feature uh, or uh, an attribute uh, which is there. There are many uh, corporations uh, which uh, have a problem with the existing definition, uh, like uh, economic partnerships. Uh, the main uh, property or the main attribute uh, is not there. Uh, corporate governance has nothing to do uh, with the form of corporation because there may be a special contract uh, for management uh, in an economic partnership. Uh, there can be third-party managers uh, in such an organization. So participants may not uh, have anything to do with management. Uh, of this organization. We uh, see that uh, there are other uh, problems uh, found uh, in the definitions of other uh, corporations that do not have boards of directors, that do not have review boards, uh, they do not even have the right uh, to sign uh, labor contracts. So this is a completely vague structure. Uh, the uh, functions of management are carried out by a managing company, which is a specialized organization. So uh, a shareholders a meeting is not a governing body. There is yet another type uh, of uh, companies. They have uh, other attributes. They have uh, workers who are also shareholders. And the uh, focus is placed not on the status uh, of a shareholder, but rather the focus is placed on the fact uh, that an employee uh, is working for the company. Uh, another consideration uh, that uh, Mr. Mogilevsky has mentioned uh, is the <coughs> emergence of uh, the so-called non-public economic agents. In that definition, uh, they include non-public uh, corporations. Uh, this uh, is a really impossible combination of different types of uh, companies that uh, fall into this one category. Uh, to evaluate uh, this, we have to understand why this uh, definition was put together this way. There was a need uh, to uh, bring assets uh, from different parties into a company. And there is one problem. It is very difficult to carry out any kind of uh, uh, corporate control. Uh, there is trading of shares, and it's easy to lose control. What can be done uh, to create a mechanism that would help to uh, retain uh, corporate control. Uh, this uh, could entail uh, certain uh, limitations in acquisition of assets. Uh, it uh, is 
a challenge uh, that has been addressed in different ways uh, at different times. Uh, the Germans have passed a law in 1892 uh, when they passed the law on uh, GmbH. They have uh, created a new type of legal entity. Uh, there are other options uh, that uh, have been created in uh, Britain and in the United States. Uh, there are ways uh, to limit free float of shares. They have open corporations in Britain and uh, uh, they have other types of corporations in the United States. We uh, seem uh, to have a redundant number of uh, articles uh, that deal with the same things. Uh, today people are talking about uh, procedures uh, for exiting uh, a company. The legislature has offered it uh, to the business community and this is something that we have to live with. This is not uh, something completely new. I see we have uh, a lot of young people in the audience. I don't know if you would remember, but older people uh, remember that there's been a law of 1990 on entrepreneurship. In that law, there was an article uh, that uh, uh, dealt uh, with uh, the uh, limited liability partnerships and uh, closed uh, type joint stock companies. Now we are coming back to that. There was another interesting uh, piece of language uh, there. Uh, the uh, members had the right uh, to a common shared property. Uh, we are glad that this language has not uh, found a way into this uh, latest uh, draft. Uh, law. Uh, this is uh, definitely very frustrating. Uh, many things are mixed up and uh, they shouldn't be. A joint stock company, whether it's uh, a public corporation or not, uh, has uh, attributes that limited liabilities do not have. They can issue shares. Uh, the free float of shares may be limited, but there is still shares, and they will remain shares. Uh, so uh, a shareholding company is going to be uh, different uh, from a limited liability company. Uh, we uh, may need uh, to uh, make a reform in the uh, documents that uh, regulate the stock market. Uh, we have to make a difference uh, between uh, participation shares and stocks. One last point uh, that I would like to make. We uh, see that uh, there uh, is um, a new uh, challenge associated with uh, merger of capitals in non-public shareholding companies. Uh, shareholders uh, may have rights uh, that are not uh, in proportion uh, to the number of shares which they hold, which seem to always be a rule of thumb. But now that is changing. I don't think that this is an appropriate uh, statement in a corporate uh, agreement uh, when rights are not in proportion uh, to uh, the number of shares held, uh, it creates confusion. Uh, the law on state uh, registration of legal entities uh, allows for that. Uh, there are uh, generic forms, uh, there are generic requirements uh, that are uh, approved and endorsed uh, by the tax authority. Uh, however, uh, four years after the law has been passed, uh, the uh, bylaws uh, or uh, regulations on implementations have not yet been developed. 
look at the procedures. Uh, pretty much everything uh, is determined by the document on issue of shares. Uh, that is the main document uh, that determines uh, shareholders' rights. You may have a thousand uh, shareholding agreements. If uh, you have a different volume uh, of rights uh, different uh, from the document on issuance of new shares. Uh, the legislator has not taken that uh, into consideration. Uh, I won't take any much of your time and I will be happy to address questions if uh, we have any. Uh, we have uh, seen changes in the law on uh, shareholding companies and the uh, requirements uh, for the schedule of shareholders' meetings have been changed from 20 days to 21 days. Why is that? This has to do with nominal shareholders. Uh, they were lacking one day uh, for uh, notifying shareholders. Uh, that is when uh, shareholders do not hold shares directly when there is a nominal holder. It's not like we're happy with uh, 21 days and we are not happy with 20. We want to make sure that everybody gets uh, information, gets all notifications within 20 days' time. I'm happy that uh, you now have a peace of mind uh, that was uh, violated by this change. Uh, when uh, my colleague talked about violations of shareholders' rights, uh, it reminded me of last year's conference at which uh, we had a discussion uh, on the changes to the uh, law on uh, shareholding companies. Uh, some uh, new uh, language was introduced and uh, there were new clauses uh, that uh, had to do with additional rights. Uh, me and uh, Dmitry have talked about it back then uh, in the context of uh, execution and implementation. All these things, they are kind of external in nature. However, uh, inside a corporation, there are also quite a lot of uh, challenges uh, when there is a conflict of interest between shareholders. Uh, it may not be a dispute between different uh, legal entities. There may be a, a certain conflict of interests uh, within a group of companies. I would now invite uh, Dmitry Stepanov, a partner at uh, Yegorov, Putinsky, Afanasyev and uh, partners firm uh, to make comments on that. We have very little time, therefore I will try to cover three things. What is the new judicial uh, practice uh, in some uh, cases that uh, deal with uh, disputes within one group of companies. Uh, we have uh, encountered uh, this uh, very complex uh, situation. Another thing that is deals approval, uh, when there is a deal within a group of companies. And uh, thirdly, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, challenges associated with court practice. I think we need to have a doctrine, um, although we uh, do not uh, have it properly developed yet. Uh, there's been some very uh, interesting cases. Uh, a, a parent company uh, may uh, offer loans uh, to uh, its uh, subsidiaries at 15% uh, of interest. Uh, on the one hand, they have uh, 
losses because they are paying interest to a bank and uh, on the other hand they are offering a loan without any interest uh, to a subsidiary. Uh, and that raises a question. Uh, there are other interesting situations uh, when a subsidiary uh, that has received uh, an interest-free loan uh, would uh, offer uh, a loan uh, to yet another subsidiary. And this way they make a profit uh, by acquiring interest on this uh, loan. Uh, there's been uh, several cases like that, and uh, within a group everything looks good. If uh, there's a loss in uh, one uh, part of the group of companies, uh, there is no loss uh, in another uh, segment. One could agree with that logic, but then we have seen some more exciting cases. Uh, let me give an example. A subsidiary uh, may uh, make a, a loss-making uh, contract. Morris uh, in Moscow region, uh, they signed a loss-making contract uh, with the contractor. The contractor is controlled by the parent company. Uh, a subsidiary signs a loss-making uh, contract and uh, it has losses on its books. Uh, there is a, a corporate uh, conflict and uh, the uh, managers a claim uh, about 1.5 billion ruble in losses. Uh, then uh, the arbitration says that there is no losses uh, at the level of a group of companies. When you have a group of companies and uh, there are subsidiaries that are 100% controlled, however, if a subsidiary has uh, uh, shareholders uh, that uh, are coming from the outside. Uh, there may be 40% uh, of exchange uh, traded shares and then minority shareholders will say, we don't want to be a loss-making company. Uh, you may be in good shape. Uh, you buy uh, corporate jets and we uh, are uh, working for the subsidiary company and we cannot make both ends meet. So that is the problem. It's not just conflicts between uh, individual shareholders. Uh, we're looking at conflicts between different uh, legal entities. Uh, the legal entity may be controlled by the same people, but they have different shareholders. Uh, we have seen uh, still other situations. Uh, there is this uh, concept that if a group of companies is doing well, then there is no problem. Uh, this has uh, created a lot of uh, distortions. Uh, there's been one case, uh, UTC Decay. Uh, there is this uh, one company, a subsidiary, they uh, signed a loss-making uh, contract. Sometime later, another company that was uh, profiting from this bad contract made a claim and uh, uh, they have received compensation and uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, defendant uh, was uh, required to pay a fine and this thing and the other. Uh, there was a judgment. Uh, they had to uh, pay a lot of money, but the court found no problem. And this, again, uh, was a situation that we have seen in 20 different cases. And again, the general concept was that if a group of company is in good shape, uh, then uh, there is no problem at all. There is another case. Uh, I'm not going to say which one. Uh, it was when the founders approved the creation of a subsidiary limited liability company and minority shareholders a year later, they were left with a corporate entity while all the money was transferred to the subsidiary. They tried to somehow sue uh, this uh, case in the uh, court, but they were told, wait for 10 years, maybe you will see some of what you lost. And I never found any, any case in the judicial practice about this. Uh, and we saw that any arguments of the founders 
of the company about any claim of losses. My uh, minority shareholders, they are always, uh, their opinion is always overruled by the majority ones. And uh, we now proceed to the law, what the law says about this. And what we see in the law, now the courts say very often that if there was a deal, but intra-group deal with some financial flow, actually these uh, uh, deals should not be approved, neither as uh, associated deals uh, nor anything else. This is considered as normal economic transaction, and this is all interest well everyone is interested that's why it does not require approval so what do we see in practice the first case uh, is with IT company Armada where the head company issued to its subsidiaries on a regular basis uh, loans uh, at very uh, uh, small interest rates uh, and when there was a bankruptcy uh, there were more than 50 percent of such deals and uh, then the court ruled that uh, the company should have approved these deals uh, now there is another lawsuit uh, uh, Safmar against uh, UVK that was a very cynical case uh, the head company issued a guarantee for its subsidiary for a value of 120% of its value. And now it has not yet reached uh, the top level course, but the uh, Court of Appeal uh, ruled that this was normal economic activities uh, case, but it should have been appro approved. If we look at this from the point of view of the group balance sheet, uh, the value of the deal was 75% of the total group uh, equity. And again, they said that if this is an intra-group uh, deal, no approval was required. Yeah, because they said that if there is no interest, because this is an intra-group deal uh, with no outsiders, uh, these deals uh, do not require any approval. We usually look at this uh, from the point of view that this is one legal entity and maybe uh, there are some members against the legal entity or whatever. But we can discuss this for hours and I think that we will not solve this problem anyway. And it seems that the number of these problems is increasing manifold if we have not solved any particular problems when talking about one legal entity. In such a case I'm talking about, the problem gets much worse. And we should not blame our courts for making such court decisions, because there is no answer to this question, neither in the doctrine nor anywhere else. The law doesn't say how this should work. So what do we need to develop law-wise? I think, first of all, we should look at our Western colleagues, uh, look at what the French say now. They have a popular concept, which is called the Rosenblum Doctrine. This is uh, named after a particular court case when the French uh, lawyers started talking about group interest. And they came to a conclusion that, that it's not that's simple. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the interests of minority shareholders inside a group, but in other cases you have to protect the interests of minority shareholders uh, and sacrifice the group interests. It depends. And I told you that in the, in the cases I told you about, usually the group interests were considered uh, uh, as overruling while in practice, different situations are different. Subsidiaries are even different. Subsidiary may be a 100% owned subsidiary by the head office. It's like a branch, even though the subsidiary is a sort of a corporate entity on its own. But if there are 20 or 30% other shareholders than those of the group, 
then that's different. And if the subsidiary is a public company, that's a third scenario. In this case, the interest of minority shareholders of a public company, uh, which is uh, then uh, the minority shareholders' uh, interest should not be overruled by the group interests. So at the level of the head company, at the level of subsidiary, the minority shareholders' interests are no way protected. Absolutely not protected. If you look at the lenders' uh, interests, uh, if you take the decisions of the bankruptcy courts, uh, uh, there the decisions are similar. Uh, looking at uh, tax relations, everything is being handled just in the opposite way as uh, we uh, as they are ruled uh, in the corporate law. So in the framework of the reform, this is a very large number of uh, issues that we need to discuss first as a doctrine and after this proceed to uh, changing uh, the law. And uh, this is uh, really crucial, these uh, uh, challenges for the 21st century law. Uh, if I may, I'd like to say something. Are you going to talk about holdings? Yes, sir. Of course, how can I avoid talking about this? So that would be wrong to keep silent if I have something to say about this. I've been working on group holdings uh, for a long time, and I would like to speak as a champion of holding companies. Holdings um, wanted, uh, 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 well, uh, for instance, Almazante was the first case so when we were very glad to see the uh, uh, decision uh, of the court and I fully support at the same time uh, what Andre said I'm really alarmed by the current situation I'm right now uh, writing comments or notes uh, about the current uh, practice uh, and now the courts are uh, having the same attitude to different deals and they say they were eight uh, transactions for uh, quite a lot of money these were guaranteed deals uh, and uh, they say well this is all intra-group deals but you have to understand that there is a difference when there is a conflicting shareholder. For instance, the subsidiary is 100% owned by the head company or when there are other minority shareholders, for instance. So we cannot simplify this. It's more complex than it seems and situations are different. So it's too light-minded to uh, call some deals uh, not a big deal. Uh, if we are talking about a large amount of money, you have to be careful. Of course, we understand if you see an extraordinary deal, you have to see what it actually is. And now that we accept holdings, uh, you shouldn't be complacent that we accept holdings. Uh, but uh, the question is, for instance, a few years ago, we spoke, spoke about the common economic goal. I was so happy that we finally tackled this uh, subject. But you see, there are global challenges, more global than what we thought. Thank you. A question to Dimitri Stepanov and probably to everyone, uh, colleagues. Any technological business, uh, it starts not from attracting investment or renting an office, but uh, it starts with registering your rights to something if your business wants to enter an international market and compete for something. If you apply uh, to Rospatient or EPCT-based uh, uh, application is filed, uh, if we're talking about LLC, for instance, if an investor comes, becomes a minority shareholder, they uh, 
a single uh, executive uh, body makes a decision to sell the patent either to Russia or to foreign country. What are the rights of minority uh, shareholders in this case? Is it regulated by the corporate agreement the investor was supposed to conclude with the current shareholders? Or are there any other mechanisms to protect the rights of investors who uh, become uh, minority shareholders in a company? I mean, you you are supposed to receive the patent uh, within a few months, but the transaction is already being prepared. Investors became part of the team. They became minority shareholders, and they want to understand, will they be able to sell their share? Will someone ask them and consult before doing something with the company? Uh, if you are talking about deceleration, uh, this can only be done by the court proceedings. Uh, if the investors uh, are knowledgeable and agile, they will probably run uh, quick enough to the court. Uh, and then if extraordinary measures are, t are taken, then the future patent will not go elsewhere. If in your corporate documents there are no limitations to the authority of the director. If it does not say, uh, the corporate documents do not say that uh, minority shareholders should be consulted and their opinions should be taken into consideration, I am afraid you won't be able to do anything. I would support what Dimitri said. In this situation, We are talking about protective measures, first of all. And uh, here, redistribution of competences uh, among the uh, bodies could be done. For instance, uh, the competency of the uh, uh, general shareholders meeting uh, is uh, being sh shaped. And this is a s uh, single uh, institute of uh, influencing the opinion of the general director. And again, talking about the minority shareholders, do they know their opportunities? Do they know their rights? Uh, out of 53 competences of the general shareholders meeting, only 15 uh, 15 questions should be voted and uh, approved uh, by 100% uh, of uh, uh, members. Uh, so minority stakeholders, uh, sometimes they do not know all their rights and uh, possibilities. And like uh, Dimitri said, it all depends on how agile you are running to the courts, uh, seeking protection for your rights. You are right. Uh, this problem has not been solved in our country. We discuss it. We argue. We had an argument with Dimitri as well about this. Uh, we spoke about the legal nature of uh, uh, bodies, about the definition of uh, the bodies. Um, uh, at the same time, we are trying to go ahead, trying to solve other problems without solving the old ones. Uh, when Dimitri was t uh, telling us about his case, uh, I saw your eyes uh, in the audience. And then Irina also added uh, a few words. Uh, and just imagine, we are now digitalizing our economy. We are starting to use the blockchain technologies for the shareholders registry. And I would like to ask Larisa Salnikova to tell us what he, she thinks about this. Uh, Larisa Salnikova is the acting uh, head of the sector of civil law and uh, arbitration process of the Institute of State and uh, Law of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So what's your opinion? Let me come back to the global trends. One of the global trends is the use of new technologies, including blockchain technologies in particular. And since we don't have much time for discussion, let me tell you where the benefit of the technology is. Number one, decentralization. Number two, transparency of all transactions. Transactions cannot be changed. And safety, relative safety. and. Uh, 
the fact that these transactions are very quick. The main conflict is uh, the following. In which areas of business can we use blockchain technologies and can we use blockchain technologies in corporate management? The first forecasts uh, made mainly by our American colleagues uh, show that blockchain technologies have a big future in corporate management uh, area, even though we do not yet know all the uh, details uh, and uh, the benefits I told you about, the benefits of blockchain technologies. How can we utilize them in corporate law? Number one, blockchain technology can ensure more equality, uh, better equality of rights of shareholders. We think that the directors are more professional, and that's why, and so on and so forth. Our American colleagues, uh, they have a different approach. They uh, say that for the shareholders to participate, to be involved, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, the stock uh, joint stock company will work much better if the shareholders are all involved in the company's business. That's their attitude, and that's the main difference between our definition of corporation and understanding of how corporations uh, work. And based on this difference. We see the benefits of blockchain technology, which is decentralization. And again, in foreign countries, in leading foreign countries like the United States, Great Britain, they have corporate standards long ago, since long ago. And they often speak about uh, agency losses, I mean the costs. Uh, uh, the cost of uh, shareholders, uh, I mean, uh, what the shareholders uh, pay the um, salaried uh, managers. This is especially critical for the banks when on a daily basis you send some information to the central bank and then the central bank comes to you and says, you know, guys, there is a big hole somewhere. We have no idea what happened, where the money left, and whatever. And you had no idea of this. And that's why the majority of economists say that uh, in future, blockchain technologies will be our key to success. And I very much hope that uh, you will have time, we will have time to discuss decentralized autonomous organizations, which well, this seems quite futuristic, even though they exist, but I think this is our future, future of corporations. Let me tell you about some things that are already being implemented. Number one, uh, where are these technologies implemented? Registries, annual shareholders meeting, general meeting, and uh, accounting. At our round table, we discussed only registries. Then, what do you mean uh, putting a registry on a blockchain technology? The law says the, register, the registry should be kept by a third party, which is the registry holder. The central bank, as the largest depository, tried to implement blockchain in 2016, and I'm not sure they managed to do that. I didn't find any open data about this. But again, are you going to pay the uh, registry holders and keepers? You'll uh, have to pay for the blockchain. Do you want this? Not really. Another context is if the law said that uh, you can keep uh, registries not only via third parties, but you could use a technology which would be transparent and open without mentioning uh, distributed uh, registries. This is just to, uh, to be neutral. In other countries as well, we see this problem. Can you organize a registry based on a blockchain technology? In Delaware, 
we see the pioneers in this respect. In Delaware, nearly all the major companies are registered. Uh, registered in, uh, I mean, the U.S. companies. And uh, they had to change their law after a number of litigations. One of the litigations uh, was uh, about the following. Uh, some um, indemnity was uh, seek, uh, was claimed. The owners of 47 million shares, uh, but at the same time, there were only 36 million shares. Realistically, were involved in the deal, and the remaining millions of shares, the shareholder thought he was the shareholder, the share owner, while the other party to the transaction thought that the other party owned these shares. And if this transaction on transfer of shares is based on blockchain te uh, technology, this would enhance the transparency of the shareholders' rights, and this will help them better manage their assets. So, in Delaware, on August 1, 2017, a change was uh, made in the law. And now registries uh, can be based uh, on uh, blockchain technologies. And I think that other US states uh, will follow the example of Delaware. Keeping a registry on based on a blockchain if you fully and only use the blockchain technology, probably it makes no sense. Maybe this is just the first step, opening up other opportunities. Uh, for instance, a general shareholders meeting. Now it's just a fiction, right? <coughs> and uh, we, they tried to persuade us that that's the right way. <coughs> the shareholders are not supposed to receive dividends. Dividends, this is obsolete and so on. Uh, the uh, they say that the shareholders, they are not supposed to manage the company and so on. But when I read what our American colleagues say, I feel that something's wrong with us here. In this case, for instance, we will enhance the transparency if the voting is done using the blockchain technology, because we can see who voted what way and uh, talking about blockchain technologies in accounting, all the transactions will be absolutely transparent. And this is also a big contribution into the control over the management of the company. No corporation is ready to open up these data. You have to understand this. It's not a problem of technologies. Uh, not all of us are ready to make our accounts public. That's why. That's why we mainly discuss uh, questions of uh, using private, not public blockchain. Bitcoin, public b blockchain, while private blockchain, it's when the information is for restricted access only. And again, uh, crypto pessimists say, how is your private blockchain, apart from the difference in technologies, how is it different from the registries you are currently keeping electronically, even though manually populating? And the business is now uh, agrees only for private registries. If the registries are based on private blockchain, there will not be a big benefit from such implementation of blockchain because there will be no transparency, no decentralization, and the management will be still able to abuse their authority. This is what I wanted to tell you since I had very little time. But this is, uh, in big picture, the situation we currently have. And I'd like to say that blockchain actually is one of the latest uh, advanced technologies which could really yield a massive economic effect. Там говорят, был программный сбой в первый день. 
Он точно загрузится или надо просто пересесть? Как фишка ляжет, вот там вот красненькая мелькает сейчас. Ну или сюда переткнуть. Уши сюда можно будет переткнуть, если Нет, что. Из ушей ничего не слышно. А если уши сюда? Вчера мы подтыкали уши в одну. Можно так попробовать. Да? И тогда мы просто. I would agree with many things Larissa said. Uh, let me add a few things. Uh, just a few uh, thoughts about uh, application of blockchain. Uh, this uh, can be viewed as a part of the digital transformation in our work. There's been uh, a statement uh, that uh, permission blockchain would not uh, provide uh, more value than legacy systems. This is uh, a technical issue. For those uh, who uh, use this database, uh, it's uh, a benefit because one can block uh, certain uh, actions uh, within a network and uh, that creates a little bit of extra comfort because there is a possibility to assign uh, certain rights. It's not going to be transparent for everyone, however, it will end uh, some parties' extra uh, capabilities, extra controls. As of the openness of information, well, uh, through assignment of access rights, you uh, can give uh, uh, specific people access uh, to information. Uh, one can see uh, who owns a share at any given point in time, and one can also take uh, uh, various uh, steps regarding this share. Uh, this could be the beginning uh, of an automation uh, process uh, in uh, transferring uh, shareholding rights. I was in one session at this forum where uh, people talked about uh, digital contracts. Uh, that uh, was one step towards uh, smart contracts. Uh, shareholders' ledgers uh, based on blockchain is a step uh, in that direction. This opens up new opportunities uh, for communication. Uh, one may have a shareholding agreement where shareholders will voluntarily uh, limit their rights. They may say, we will not uh, come up with nominations uh, before we get agreement uh, from other shareholders. Or shareholders may uh, reject their right uh, to approve transactions before other shareholders uh, voice uh, their agreement with that transaction. Those kinds of things uh, could be automated in a much higher degree. Uh, we could prevent many violations uh, that otherwise would be possible. This is uh, an automation in a uh, legal domain. Uh, we uh, would do uh, quite a bit in the way of violation preventions. We would eliminate uh, various uh, disputable situations and that would eliminate uh, many lawsuits. We could uh, automate the procedures for transfer of shares. 
we could limit uh, the number of people or categories of people who are allowed uh, to buy and sell shares. Uh, those kinds of things are being done already. Uh, you mentioned Delaware. Uh, there's been one venue that has raised $300 million uh, to build a system of this type. Uh, this is a venue for uh, security token trading. But uh, that's not the point of what I'm saying. The bottom line is, these uh, changes are happening, but they are not happening overnight. This is a step-by-step -step process. We make small steps and uh, we give an additional degree of freedom uh, to the people where it does not increase the risk level. Many shareholders would love to be able to participate in shareholders' meetings remotely. For that uh, to be possible, uh, there's got to be a system of individual authentication for shareholders. Uh, we know that uh, Goss's Logi service is using that capability. Uh, people can vote uh, using the authentication uh, service at Gosses Lugi. We can think of the next steps. Uh, registrars uh, can do a lot more by providing uh, various uh, services to uh, third parties. It's possible to track uh, the status of shareholders ledger if uh, blockchain technology was used as a foundation. Such systems could be integrated with uh, uh, supervisory uh, systems. Uh, a competition authority uh, can uh, be granted access uh, to this uh, system for their purposes, and that would be uh, definitely an improvement, and uh, Russia would fare even better in doing business rating. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Stanislav. I uh, hope uh, we can finish this session on time. Uh, we are here to talk about global trends. Uh, Larissa talked about it. Uh, decentralized standalone organizations uh, are becoming quite numerous. They can be uh, treated like uh, shareholding companies. We uh, could say uh, that uh, tokens are similar in nature to shares. Therefore, we are dealing with uh, virtual legal entities. I'm not saying that uh, this is the mainstream in Russian practices. Uh, we uh, see that uh, Many uh, companies today do their business online. They become uh, virtual companies and uh, they are difficult uh, to locate geographically. Some of major Russian banks uh, proposed uh, that uh, the location of a legal entity should be determined uh, when uh, this entity opens up an account. Now there is uh, an option for 
remote uh, voting at uh, shareholders' meetings. Uh, this uh, goes well in line uh, with the uh, 1132 Directive of the European Union. Uh, this is uh, a new digital environment. Uh, there are algorithmic uh, companies. Uh, they operate in a new environment. There is a different uh, level of choice of jurisdiction, and it's not suitable for all companies. Uh, for IT organizations, this may be an interesting uh, an attractive option. Uh, you can look at Kaliningrad region that uh, I come from. Uh, we uh, have a uh, special legal regime uh, in our uh, part of the country. Um, however, we don't think that uh, for traditional legal entities, that makes uh, much sense. For e-companies, uh, that is different. The possibility uh, to enter our jurisdiction uh, may be attractive uh, for foreign companies. Last year, uh, we had an interesting discussion uh, of an initiative uh, coming from Estonia. Uh, they have proposed uh, to uh, use the concept of e-residence. Uh, this uh, raised a lot of concerns and uh, interest. The uh, Kaliningrad Region uh, Development Corporation uh, was uh, quite interested uh, in this. They thought that uh, they needed to use new mechanisms to raise attractiveness uh, of a region. In Estonia, uh, that uh, concept uh, did not fly uh, for some reasons that I don't want to uh, discuss today. Uh, we uh, had an interesting uh, statement uh, from uh, my colleague. Uh, she talked about Generation Z. Uh, these young people do not uh, trust traditional legal organizations uh, for different reasons. Uh, they are very individualistic. Uh, therefore, such decentralized organizations may uh, fit uh, their needs quite well. They may be exactly what they're looking for. Several times at this uh, forum, uh, people uh, talked about uh, the uh, problem associated with corporate law. We uh, think we can find ourselves uh, in a position uh, of a regulator uh, who uh, wanted uh, to uh, create uh, a regulation uh, for operations of uh, cabs. We may see different reactions and responses to such initiatives, but obviously we are witnessing the arrival of uh, new uh, legal concepts. That is a fact of life. Uh, a virtual company is a general term. There are quite a few of them today. In the United States, uh, they use uh, the concept decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, they have coined quite uh, a number of other uh, terms, but not all of them are used uh, broadly. We are looking at uh, many alternative projects and uh, uh, people evaluate them and see which of them make better sense. Uh, 
Uh, if I may, I would like to make a quick comment. I'm Kirill Moladik of the uh, Higher uh, School of Economics. Uh, we uh, uh, did uh, some experimenting with uh, blockchain. I have the impression that uh, we are making a mistake that technical people uh, tend uh, to make. Uh, some people who participated in a technology contest uh, made uh, many interesting proposals to use blockchain uh, for various business purposes. We told uh, those uh, contenders uh, from different uh, R&D centers and universities, we told them that decentralized and centralized systems should not be mixed. Uh, we should be clear uh, who is going to validate uh, entries uh, that uh, are made uh, in various registries. In a corporate world, uh, distribution, distributed systems uh, can be appropriate uh, where a distributed validation uh, is relevant. Uh, if uh, a company and its management uh, provides uh, validation, then a blockchain could make sense. However, uh, if you have uh, a limited liability company or any other form of incorporation, there is one uh, individual uh, who uh, performs that function. In that case, uh, they have a centralized system. They don't need blockchain. Uh, please be careful uh, with those technologies. You should always uh, draw a line between centralized and decentralized systems. I suggest that uh, we should bring the session to an end on this high note. Thank you very much to all panelists. Uh, I said that we will be posting uh, all the presentations and statements that have been made in this session. Thank you very much.